Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier Love Vlog. Today we take on a new topic and we'll be talking about the secrecy of bank deposits as well as its exceptions and the Foreign Currency Deposit Act. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. You can also find me on Alex at www.alexlegal.ph Alex is an online directory of lawyers which makes it easy for people like you to connect with lawyers like me for legal assistance from the convenience of your mobile phones, tablets, laptops, and other devices. I will insert a link to my profile in the description below so you can easily reach out or schedule an appointment with me. <clears throat> so today, again, we discuss the law on the secrecy of bank deposits which is found in Republic Act No. 1405 otherwise known as an act prohibiting disclosure of or inquiry into deposits with any banking institution and providing a penalty therefore as amended by presidential decree number 1792 okay now as with any other subject it will be easier to understand the principles if you understand the purpose of the law the purpose of the law on secrecy of bank deposits is to encourage the people to deposit their money in banking institutions and to discourage private hoarding so that the same may be properly utilized by banks in authorized loans to assist in the economic development of the country. In other words, it is better to deposit your money in the bank rather than just burying it in uh, soil, under the soil, okay? Now, as stated in Ejercito v. Sandigan Bayan, after World War II, capital and credit facilities for agricultural and industrial development in the country were lacking. So rehabilitation of the banking system became a major government thrust. However, private hoarding of money was rampant because people feared government inquiry into their bank deposits for tax collection purposes. So, this law, RA 1405, was passed with the belief that the benefits accruing to the economy with the influx of deposits would counterbalance any losses in case the law would facilitate tax evasion. So, as stated in BSB versus Go, this law would encourage people to deposit their money in banking institutions so that it may be utilized by way of authorized loans and thereby assist in economic development. So what exactly does this law provide? Section 2 gives us the general rule. All deposits of whatever nature with banks or banking institutions in the Philippines, including investments in bonds issued by the Philippine government, are hereby considered as of an absolutely confidential nature and may not be in examined, inquired, or looked into by any person, government official, bureau, or office. Okay? The law, in effect, respects the privacy of the bank deposit and you cannot simply ask how much is, uh, uh, how, what is the amount contained in this certain deposit of this certain person, okay? That's bawal, okay? In this regard, Section 3 of the law makes it unlawful for any official or employee of a banking institution to disclose any information concerning said deposits to any person unless, of course, it falls under the exceptions to the law. Now, this uh, law is similar huh, but not the same to data privacy. Okay, The banks have a duty to protect the information. Okay, So, they cannot just disclose or reveal the information, especially the amounts of the deposit, to just anyone, okay? Unless, of course, it falls under any of the exceptions, which I will be discussing in a bit. Take note 
that while subsequent statutory enactments may have expanded the list of exceptions, the secrecy of bank deposits still lies as the general rule. Okay? Falling as it does within the legally recognized zones of privacy. As such, a prayer for the provisional remedy of garnishment that does not violate the law on secrecy of bank deposits. First, let's define garnishment. Garnishment is a species of attachment for reaching credits belonging to the judgment debtor and owing to him from a stranger to the litigation, such as in the case of bank deposits. The judgment debtor has an account with the bank. No, The bank is a stranger, okay? And uh, the stranger to the litigation. And now that can be subject of garnishment. In China Bank versus Ortega, the Supreme Court said that the order of the court to Leong to inform the court whether BNB Corporation has a deposit in China Bank and if there is, to hold the same and not allow any withdrawal until further order, that order does not violate the law on secrecy of bank deposits. Why? Because said order does not contemplate an examination or inquiry into the deposit itself just to inform the court if a deposit actually exists and not to permit any withdrawal. It was not the intention of the legislature in creating Act for, uh, Republic Act 1405 to place bank deposits beyond the reach of execution to satisfy a final judgment, okay? That was not the, the intention of, of the le legislature, okay? There is no real inquiry in an order for garnishment. If the existence of the deposit were disclosed, the disclosure is purely incidental to the execution process. As stated in RCBC versus De Castro, to expose garnishes to risks for obeying court orders and processes would only undermine the administration of justice. Okay? So through garnishment, you can ask you can uh, through the court issuing a writ of garnishment you can ask does and uh, does this uh, does the respondent have an account with you you're not necessarily asking how much so it does not violate the law on secrecy of bank deposits so the secrecy of bank deposits law is not absolute there are exceptions and what are those exceptions the law in section 2 itself gives us some exceptions first upon written permission of the depositor. This is why, if you have been following the news since uh, 2016, a certain senator has been demanding that a certain executive officer reveal the real status of his funds deposited in banks by executing a waiver. Okay, if you've seen that on the news, sign the waiver now. Okay, this is what the waiver that is, uh, this is what the waiver that senator is talking about. Because even though government workers are obligated to execute a sal n, meaning the statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth, they are still protected from unwarranted inspection of their bank deposits, which will remain secret unless they execute a waiver giving written permission to inspect their deposits or if it falls under any of the following exceptions. Okay? Second exception where uh, the law of secrecy of bank deposits will not apply in cases of impeachment. Okay? And impeachment refers to the power of Congress to remove a public official. Okay, this list is exclusive, no? specifically only the President, Vice President, Justices of the Supreme Court, members of the Constitutional Commissions, and the Ombudsman. Now, the grounds are also exclusive. The only grounds for impeachment are for serious crimes or misconduct, specifically culpable violation of the Constitution, treason, bribery, graft and corruption, other high crimes, or betrayal of public trust. Again, the list of public officers and the grounds are exclusive. If they do not fall under the list, then they are not the proper subject of impeachment. 
Now, the purpose of impeachment is not to punish but only to remove and disqualify an officer who does not deserve to hold office. So if an official is impeached, there is no criminal penalty of imprisonment. The penalty is just removal and disqualification from office. But the impeached official may still be criminally charged okay, before the regular courts. Now, while it is the House of Representatives that has the exclusive power to initiate all cases of impeachment, it is the Senate that has the sole power to try and decide all cases of impeachment. And if it is the president that is on trial, then it is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court that will preside over the trial, but he will not vote. Okay? To impeach any of the public officials that I just mentioned, a vote of two-thirds of all the members of the Senate is necessary. So impeachment is an exception to the secrecy of bank deposits, especially where it is necessary to compare the deposits to the declarations made in the SAL-IN in order to determine if the official should indeed be impeached. The next exception is upon the order of a competent court in cases of bribery or dereliction of duty of public officials. When we say direct bribery, that is committed by any public officer who shall agree to perform an act constituting a crime in connection with the performance of his official duties in consideration of any offer, promise, gift, or present that he receives personally or through the mediation of another. Indirect bribery is committed by any public officer who shall accept gifts offered to him by reason of his office. Qualified bribery is committed by any public officer who is entrusted with law enforcement, no police, who refrains from arresting or prosecuting an offender who has committed a crime punishable by reclusion perpetua and or death in consideration of any offer, promise, gift, or present. And dereliction of duty consists in the following crimes. For judges, knowingly rendering unjust judgment, judgment rendered through negligence, unjust interlocutory order, malicious delay in the in, in administration of justice, and those are the crimes committed by judges. For prosecutors, we have negligence and tolerance in the prosecution of offenses. And for lawyers, we have betrayal of trust. So for these to be exceptions, there must be an ongoing case. And the court must issue an order allowing inquiry into the subject bank deposit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Take note also that in Ejercito versus Sandigan Bayan, plunder, the crime of plunder, is analogous to bribery and therefore also constitutes an exception to the law on secrecy of bank deposits. <clears throat> in cases, next uh, exception, sorry, next exception. In cases where the money deposited or invested is the subject matter of litigation, okay? If the money deposited is the subject matter of the litigation, then it is an exception to the law on secrecy of bank deposits. And this is clear enough. Now, from the words itself, we should be able to understand it. And of course, in this case, the court must also issue an order allowing the examination of the bank deposit. In this regard, take note of the case of Marquez versus Desierto, where the Supreme Court ruled that an investigation by the ombudsman is not a litigation. It's not a trial, okay? It's just an investigation, okay? And therefore, it does not fall under the exemption to, exception to the bank secrecy law. In case it is granted, in case an order to inspect the uh, bank deposit is granted for an ombudsman investigation, then that would be equivalent to the ombudsman fishing for evidence to formally charge the account holder. So clearly, the, if there is no pending case, it would not warrant the opening of a bank account for inspection. Take note that where a court order is required, 
it <coughs> excuse me <coughs> it is only the court that may issue again where a court order is required it is only the court that can issue an order inquiring into the bank deposit as such, no, a prosecutor in a preliminary investigation cannot issue an order inquiring into the bank deposit because a preliminary investigation is not yet a trial and is not a pending litigation. Also, a congressional inquiry in aid of legislation, that's also not a pending litigation. And Congress is also not a competent court. So therefore, that prosecutor, Congress, they cannot inquire into bank deposits. Take note that if the money deposited is the subject of litigation, the inquiry as to the whereabouts of the amount necessarily extends to whatever is concealed, held, or recorded in the name of other persons as the case is aimed at recovering the amount converted. Okay? That's uh, what was held in the case of Mellon Bank versus Magsino. Now, under PD 1792, there are more exceptions, okay? First, when the examination is made in the course of a special or general examination of a bank and is specifically authorized by the monetary board after being satisfied that there is a reasonable ground to believe that a bank fraud or serious irregularity has been or is being committed and that it is necessary to look into the deposit to establish such fraud or irregularity. The next exception still under PD 1792 is when the examination is made by an independent auditor hired by the bank to conduct its regular audit provided that the examination is for audit purposes only and the results thereof shall be for the exclusive use of the bank. <clears throat> now, subsequent statutory enactments have expanded the list of exceptions to the secrecy of bank deposits law. First, under Section 6, F of RA 8424 or the National Internal Revenue Code, not the tax code, which is uh, which section 6F has not been affected by the train law. That section 6F serves as an exception to the law on secrecy of bank deposits by allowing the Commissioner of Internal Revenue to inquire into bank deposits of the following. First, a decedent okay in order to determine his gross estate and second <clears throat> any taxpayer who has filed an application for compromise of his tax liability on the ground of financial incapacity to pay his tax liability okay which application should be accompanied by a waiver of his privilege under the law on secrecy of bank deposits of course the commissioner of internal revenue has to determine if he really is financially inca incapable now other statutory exceptions can be found under Republic Act number no. 9160 as amended no it has undergone uh, several amendments no and this law refers to the anti money laundering act which i'll be referring to here on as amla okay for uh, brevity so specifically when covered persons including banks and other covered institutions are required to report to the AMLC Okay, or Anti-Money Laundering Council, any single series or combination of transactions involving a total amount in excess of 500,000 pesos or its equivalent in foreign currency within five working days from the occurrence thereof unless a longer period is prescribed but not to exceed 15 days. Okay, that's the first ex uh, exception under AMLA to the law on secrecy of bank accounts no when they the covered persons are required to make a report of a covered or suspicious transaction okay take note that while uh, exempt from the secrecy of deposits law the bank or covered institution is still prohibited from communicating the fact that a covered or suspicious transaction was made and the contents of the report or any other information to any person okay they, they shouldn't tell it to anyone else 
Next exception under AMLA. The AMLC, the council, no, may inquire into or examine any particular deposit or investment with any banking institution or non-bank financial institution upon the order. Okay, again, there's an order of the competent court in cases of violation of the AMLA when it has been established that there is probable cause that the deposits or investments are related to an unlawful activity or a money laundering offense. Okay? Money laundering, I'll talk about that in another video, but in general, that's committed by any person who knows that the monetary instrument or property represents, involves, or relates to the proceeds of any unlawful activity, and then, knowing that, he transacts, converts, transfers, acquires, or possesses the instrument or property. It may also be committed by concealing, disguising the true nature, the source, the location, disposition, movement, or ownership of rights over the said instrument or property. Or it may even be an attempt, conspiracy, or aiding, or abetting, or counseling the commission of money laundering. Failing to report a uh, covered or suspicious transaction to the AMLC when so required is also a money laundering offense. Even the mere performance or failure to, failure to perform any act which results in the facilitation of money laundering, that is also a money laundering offense. Now, when I mentioned unlawful activities earlier, that list is very long and we can talk about that in a different video. Okay, But for now, unlawful activities include plunder, robbery, qualified theft, estafa, etc. Okay? And in these cases, a court order is required. But take note that the law also allows for situations that a court order is no longer necessary to inquire into the bank deposits. No? And these are when the unlawful activity is kidnapping for ransom, certain sections of the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act, destructive arson, murder, hijacking, and other violations of Republic Act 6235, which is an act prohibiting certain acts inimical to civil aviation. So, like compelling an airplane to change direction, to land, to usurp control over the aircraft, etc. Okay? Now, the next statutory exception is under the Unclaimed Balances Law which is uh, RA 3936 as amended by PD 679. And this involves a disclosure by all banks, building and loan associations, and trust corporations to the treasurer of the Philippines of bank deposits which have been dormant for 10 years, meaning that there were no deposits, no withdrawals made during that time. A copy of the statement will also be posted in the premises of the concerned institution provided that the institution should first attempt to communicate with the owner of the dormant account. What happens to these unclaimed funds? They will be deposited with the treasurer to the credit of the government to be used as the Congress may direct. Next, another statutory exception is found in RA 7653 or the New Central Bank Act as amended by RA 11211. Specifically, under Section 26 or otherwise known as the DOSRI rule, DOSRI, meaning directors, officers, stockholders, or related interest. Okay? In case any of those persons contract a loan or any form of financial accommodation from his bank or subsidiary or uh, bank that has a controlling interest or is controlled by his bank, read up on that law na lang to uh, find out which uh, specifically. No? As long as they get a loan from their bank or the subsidiary, they shall be required by the lending bank to waive the secrecy of his deposits in all banks in the Philippines. This is to determine if they have used their positions as directors, officers, stockholders, or related interests to influence the granting of the loan. Okay, So you can prevent fraud and other uh, machinations. 
Now, the next statutory exception is found in Section 8 of Republic Act 3019 or the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act which states that if a public official has been found to have acquired during his incumbency, whether in his name or in the name of other persons, an amount of prob or of, or, of property or money manifestly out of proportion to his salary, salary and to his other lawful income, then that fact shall be a ground for dismissal or removal. In this regard, consideration may be taken of his bank deposits. No? Meaning, in other words, now, if you have unlawful gains, if that public official has unlawful gains, then his bank accounts may be inquired into okay consideration may be taken of his bank deposits and other properties in the name of his spouse or unmarried children the supreme court in pnb versus gankaiko expressly declared section 8 to constitute an exception to the law on secrecy of bank deposits especially since cases of unexplained wealth are similar to cases of bribery or dereliction of duty. Now, an exception that is slowly losing relevance because of the passage of time no, involves inquiries into bank deposits, trusts or investment funds, or banking transactions when there is reasonable ground to believe that they have been used in support or in furtherance of the December 1989 coup d'etat under Republic Act 6832. Now, the newest statutory exception is under Republic Act Number no. 11479 or the Anti-Terror Law where upon issuance by the court of a preliminary order of prescription or in case of designation, then the AMLC, the Anti-Money Laundering Council, is given the authority to investigate any property or funds that are in any way related to the financing of terrorism and property or funds of any person or persons in relation to whom there is probable cause to believe that such persons are committing or attempting or conspiring to commit or participating in or facilitating the financing of terrorism. So uh, the court can give an order to check the bank accounts to see if it was used, if the if funds were used for the financing of terrorism, like to buy bombs or whatever. So, let's say a person has a savings account, a checking account, a money market placement, and a trust fund. Okay? What are covered by the law on secrecy of bank deposits? Only the savings, checking, and trust fund are covered. The money market placement is not covered because it is not deposited in the bank. Under Ejercito versus Sandigan Bayan, the trust fund is included even if there is no credit or debtor relationship between the trustor and the bank because the word deposits is to be understood broadly. The test is if the money deposited under an account may be used by banks for authorized loans to third persons, then such account, regardless of whether it creates a credit or debt or relationship between the depositor and the bank, will fall under the secrecy of bank deposits law. However, also take note that a safety deposit box, no? even if you don't deposit money in that box, that is still included under the protection of the law of secrecy of bank deposits because the law includes all deposits of whatever nature with banks okay safety box safety deposit box included now let's say a person paid for goods using a check which bounced if the seller calls up the drawee bank to inquire about the name of the drawer as written on the dishonored check, can the bank refuse to disclose the name by saying, wait, no, there's uh, the law on secrecy of bank deposits? No, because what the law protects is inquiry into the amount of the, the deposit. Here, it is only the name that is being inquired into. 
However, whether such information is protected under other laws, such as the Data Privacy Act, is a different issue. If what is being asked is merely the name as it appears on the bounce check and not whether the person is a client of the bank, then I see no problem with disclosing that information. Okay. Another example. Let's say X secures a favorable judgment for a sum of money against Y. It just so happens that X and Y are both stockholders in Bank Z. So X goes to Bank Z and he invokes his right as stockholder to inspect the corporate books and records and he demands to see if Y has a deposit with Bank Z. The manager of Bank Z refuses, invoking RA 1405, who is correct. The manager is correct because the law on secrecy of bank deposits must prevail over the right to inspect corporate records. Does X have any remedy? Yes, he can go to court to secure a writ of garnishment. Because as I discussed earlier, garnishment is valid. Okay, valid against the it can prevail over the law of it will not violate the law on secrecy of bank deposits okay now we can move on to the foreign currency deposit act or republic act 6426 as amended now this uh, law no i'll call it fcda for short allows any person to deposit and for banks to accept for deposit any foreign currency acceptable as part of the Philippines National Reserve. Under this law, foreign currency deposits enjoy absolute confidentiality and cannot be examined, inquired, or looked into by any person or office, whether public or private, or judicial, administrative, or legislative. This is similar to what I discussed earlier on the law on secrecy of bank deposits. But while RA1405 applies generally to all banks in the bank deposits in the Philippines, RA6426, the FCDA, was intended to encourage deposits from foreign lenders and investors and is a special law designed specially for foreign currency deposits in the Philippines. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule on absolute confidentiality of foreign currency deposits. First, with the written permission of the depositor, so waiver. No? Second, the exceptions I mentioned earlier on AMLA, specifically with court order in cases of uh, deposits related to unlawful activities or money laundering offenses, or without court order in cases of kidnapping, drugs, hijacking, arson, murder, and uh, offenses against civil aviation. Third, under the anti-terror law where the AMLC is investigating funds relating to uh, financing of terrorism. And fourth, take note of the case of Estrada versus Desierto where it was ruled that the FCDA does not apply to deposits of Philippine residents. This is very important. Huh? It does not apply to Philippine residents as the law is intended only for depositors who are non-residents who are not engaged in trade and business in the Philippines as stated in the whereas clauses of the FCDA. Citing Salvacion versus Central Bank, it was stated that foreign currency deposits of Filipino depositors are not covered by the FCDA. Okay, now take note under Section 8 foreign currency deposits are exempt from attachment, garnishment, or any other order or process of any court, legislative body, government agency, or any administrative body whatsoever exempt from attachment or garnishment however take note of this special case of salvation which i mentioned earlier where a minor was raped by an american tourist and the minor was eventually awarded damages in a case against the american who had a dollar deposit with china bank when the deposit was attempted to be garnished, the bank refused, citing the FCDA, which exempts foreign currency deposit accounts from attachment or garnishment. 
In this case of Salvacion, the Supreme Court made an exception and ruled that the FCDA does not protect and will not apply to a foreign currency deposit of a transient alien depositor under the peculiar circumstances of this case. As such, China Bank was ordered to release the dollar deposit of the American in such amount as would satisfy the judgment. But take note, okay? Given that case, take note that you should only take this case pro hac vice, meaning in only this special instance. You should only apply this case to other cases with similar circumstances. In other words, the general rule will still apply. Meaning that foreign currency deposit accounts maintained by transient alien depositors are still absolutely confidential and exempt from attachment or garnishment. Finally, since both RA 1405 and the FCDA are special laws, Act Number no. 3326 governs its prescriptive period. Considering that the penalty for violation of either of those two laws is imprisonment for not more than five years, then the offense under either of the law prescribes in eight years from commission or discovery and institution of judicial proceedings as may be applicable. Okay. Now, as of the time of this recording, there may be other uh, bills pending in uh, Congress to add more exceptions to the law on secrecy on bank accounts. No? I will just update with new videos as soon as those bills become laws. Okay? But as of this uh, recording, these are the existing exceptions. Okay? So I hope you may have picked up a th thing or two from this, guys. And I hope to see you soon. Okay? Bye!